Fuddruckers, a name that's just as intriguing as its history. Once a big shot in the burger game, this chain has faced its share of highs and lows. At its peak, it boasted more than 200 outlets, predominantly in Texas, but extending to nearly every state. Fast forward to today, and they're down to fewer than 100 outlets across just 23 states. That's a pretty significant contraction. Their struggle is also reflected in a 2010 bankruptcy filing, and a close call was shutting down altogether in 2020, before a white knight investor came to the rescue. With a four-decade history and eight different owners, Fuddruckers is a case study in the life of an American restaurant chain. Our story begins with Phil Romano, a Florida Atlantic University graduate with a strong culinary drive. After dipping his toes into the restaurant business, Romano moved to Texas in the 1970s to chase his dream. By 1980, he'd hatched an innovative idea, a burger that occupied the sweet spot between fast food and sit-down dining. Remember, this was way before the days of fast casual eateries like Chipotle and Panera. So what he was thinking was groundbreaking. According to Fuddruckers, they serve the world's greatest hamburgers. And no, that's not a personal endorsement. It's a bold tagline that has been part of their branding since the 80s. But they do seem to take their burger game seriously. Romano set up shop in a converted San Antonio bank and started selling what he claimed were the world's best burgers or at least burgers that were a cut above typical fast food fare. Originally, the restaurant was called Freddy Fuddruckers, but the Freddy part was quickly jettisoned. While some speculate that the name might be a playful nod to a fictional airline called Fuddpucker, it seems likely that the moniker's main goal was to turn heads in peak curiosity. After establishing the second outlet in Houston, Texas, the brand underwent its first ownership shift in 1983, thanks to a public stock offering. Although Romano remained the largest shareholder, this marked the beginning of his gradual detachment from the brand. By 1985, Romano had stepped down as CEO and eventually sold most of his shares to focus on other culinary ventures, like Romano's Macaroni Grill, Meanwhile, Foodruckers was expanding at a rapid pace, propelled by a mix of corporate-owned and franchise locations. But this speedy growth led to their first misstep, overextension. They started losing money, but managed to steady the ship by streamlining operations and offloading some outlets to franchisees. The brand underwent another transformation in 1988 when it merged with DACA International, a leading food service contract company. The idea was that pooling resources would lead to efficiencies, especially in procurement and logistics. DACA specialized in running cafeterias and in institutional settings like universities and hospitals, so the merger seemed like a sensible strategic move at the time. So there you have it, a whirlwind tour of food ruckers, a company that has faced its share of triumphs and tribulations. With its history of multiple ownerships, rapid expansions, and near-death experiences, the story of Fuddruckers serves as an intriguing lesson in American business. Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the complexities of this fascinating brand. Now imagine you get handed a juicy, plain burger, and then it's showtime. You head over to a toppings buffet, where you have free reign to customize your meal to your heart's desire. Not only is this setup interactive and fun, but it's also cost-effective for the restaurant since there's no need for servers. During DACA's tenure at the helm, about a decade, the chain experienced substantial growth, nearly doubling its footprint and even making some unconventional moves, like many outlets within Home Depot stores known as Fuddruckers Express. However, this ambitious experiment was short-lived and essentially flopped. But alas, not all that glitters is gold. During the late 90s, Fuddruckers started running into problems. Expansion was too rapid, leading to poor site selections. Moreover, their unique selling proposition, the world's greatest hamburger, started to lose its luster. Here's the thing. Fuddruckers' claim to the world's greatest burger was founded on freshness. They showcased their own butcher shop and bakery right within their restaurants. Plus, the open layout allowed patrons to see freshly chopped vegetables and handcrafted buns. But as they expanded, they made a critical error. They stopped emphasizing these differentiating factors. As a result, their bold claim began to sound more like marketing fluff. Adding to the complexity, DACA, the parent company, was juggling multiple responsibilities, including running other restaurant chains like Champs and Great Bagel and Coffee. 
This led to investor concerns about a lack of focus on Fuddruckers. By 1997, DACA restructured, shedding its cafeteria operations and spinning off Fuddruckers into a new entity called Unique Casual Restaurants. However, the saga didn't end there. In 1998, a new chapter began when Fuddruckers was acquired for $43 million by King Cannon, a private company led by Michael Cannon, a well-known name in the restaurant industry. Michael Cannon was ready to roll up his sleeves and infuse new life into Fuddruckers. He brought in a rock and roll vibe that quickly resonated with customers and gave the restaurant interiors a facelift. The menu also saw some exciting additions and updates, all aimed at rejuvenating the brand. And fast forward to 2010, and the Fuddruckers brand hit another rough patch. The exact reasons are hard to pinpoint, given that it was privately owned at the time, but it's safe to say that the economic downturn likely played a significant role. When budgets are tight, consumers often gravitate toward more budget-friendly options like McDonald's rather than premium spots like Fuddruckers. This financial strain led to a bankruptcy filing, resulting in the assets being acquired by private equity firm Tavistock for $40 million. In a quick twist, those assets were resold a month later for $61 million to another iconic brand, Luby's Cafeteria. At first glance, Luby's seemed like a logical fit for Fuddruckers. Both brands were Texas-born, with Luby's aimed at a more adult, traditional audience and Fuddruckers targeting families and kids. In fact, Fuddruckers had successfully lured families since the 90s with promotions like Kids Eat Free After 4 p.m. from Monday to Thursday, making it a popular choice for family dining. Luby's tried to leverage this by creating dual-concept locations. The vision was grand, but the execution fell short. Already grappling with falling sales and accumulating debt, Luby's had bit off more than they could chew. The acquisition and subsequent efforts to turn things around proved unsuccessful, leading to more closures and declines in sales. You could argue the downturn was due to several factors. A general waning interest in cafeteria-style dining, operational inefficiencies, or perhaps lingering issues from previous ownerships. And let's not forget, all these troubles predated the COVID-19 pandemic, which only worsened the situation. In a turn of events, the brand found a savior in 2021 when Black Titan Franchise Systems, led by Nicholas Perkins, acquired Fuddruckers for $18.5 million. This acquisition made history as Perkins became the first African American to own 100% of a national burger franchise. While the acquisition appears partly motivated by personal passion for the brand, Perkins has ambitious plans to revitalize Fuddruckers. So, what's next for for Fuddruckers. It's a story filled with ups and downs, but could there be a silver lining on the horizon? Let me know your thoughts. Do you believe this iconic chain, which boasts the world's greatest hamburger, can be saved? And if you don't agree that Fuddruckers has the world's best burger, then who does? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more captivating business insights.